Hello students, here we are for our last lecture on Thursday. It's not do, not too long, so don't worry about that. I know you're probably burned out already from uh, three hours of lecture today or so. Anyway, here we go. So now make sure you watch the AM session first where I talked about esophageal pathology, uh, or esophageal, the normal anatomy, and then come to this one because you... Well, I don't know if you'll be lost, but it's always better to do the anatomy warm-up first. Uh, but yeah, here we go. So we're start, starting to talk about esophageal disorders today. And so pain, esophageal pain, there's two mechanisms that can produce pain. We got a, These are painful, many of these esophageal disorders. So we need to tell you where that pain comes from. So one way we talked about already, remember in the mucosa layer, there are nociceptive fibers. So you can stimulate those nociceptive, aka chemoreceptors, and that'll set off esophageal pain. Or if the if let's say you get an ulceration and the ulcer gets down into the submucosa, you got bigger nerve fibers, more nerve fibers, so you get more pain that way. Uh, gastric acid and uh, stomach contents are common for causing these types of pains. But you could also get what we're going to talk about today. Maybe something gets stuck in the esophagus. You've got esophageal stenosis and it gets stuck and it stretches the esophagus as food backs out. Uh, that can start to cause a stretch or receptor type of pain. So those are two mechanisms, two ways you can get pain. Now there's no somatosensory type of nerves like you have in your fingertips. So the sensation of pain travels via the autonomic system. Uh, so both the parasympathetic, aka vagal, afferents, and sympathetic varents. So those guys aren't very good at, at letting the brain know exactly where the, the pain is coming from. Uh, so the brain gets a little confused and it'll start naming other similar parts even though there's nothing wrong. Uh, these are, this is considered visceral pain. Okay, so these afferent pain pathways significantly overlap in the sensory cortex, so the brain doesn't know where they're coming from. The brain typically says the pain is coming from all over the place, including anywhere in the chest, so people think they're having a heart attack. Down in the retral sternal region, around, or around the sternum is the retral sternal area, commonly where gastroesophageal reflux disease comes from. Down by the xiphoid process, uh, is another one that's where dyspepsia typically comes from or presents. Uh, and then the pleura type pain, like from the back even, the lungs uh, can be mistaken as well. So these guys can all mix. It's very difficult to tell where this type of pain is coming from. So now let's talk about the actual con diseases of the esophagus. We'll start with congenital diseases. Uh, we've got to fall down a little rabbit hole and talk a little bit about some embryology, uh, many congenital conditions of the esophagus occur when the esophagus fails to separate from the trachea or lungs during fetal development, uh, So, uh, i.e. the foregut. So I know you've probably forgot all about that. So just a little quick review. Remember, uh, gastrulation occurs and makes a trilaminar disc from a bilaminar disc. The disc is still flat. We have three. We have the the new layers though created, right? Mesoderm, endoderm, the ectoderm on the top. Now about on week four, this thing is going to start to fold. Uh, the endoderm does not grow very much, but the ectoderm grows like crazy, and so does the amnion, which is not drawn here. But this starts to starts to pivot down. Let me try my new drawing. I'm using a new computer this time. And let's see, did the drawing tool still work? Yes, they do. Um, maybe not quite as nicely as the old Windows 7. Uh, but these guys will grow out like this. And they'll literally fold this in half because these guys don't grow. Okay, so you get a folding uh, of the flat trilaminar disc like this. And that creates the the tube within tube body design. Here's a better pitch. I should have just went over here. Um, but here's the the endoderm growing like crazy. 
There's the amnion as well growing like crazy. And it grows and it grows and grows. And nothing, here's the endoderm, nothing happens. And it grows and grows and grows and comes around and actually pinches the secondary yolk sac in half. Uh, and as it does, the endoderm is bent right around with it. And there's your gut. That's the esophagus. That's your stomach. It's your duodenum, your jejunum, your ileum, your large intestine, your segment coil. Everything comes from this, uh, this endoderm here. So all this epithelial tissue we're talking about is endodermal in, in origin. Okay, and we'll talk about the vital, and we'll come back to this later uh, in CVP class, or I forget which one we talked to. I guess GIGU. We'll talk about Meckel's diverticulums and things like that. All right, so there's the completed uh, folding. That's occurred toward the end of the fourth week. Now we got, uh, if we're up toward the cranial region, that's the foregut. If we look at the long axis, here's the cranial region up here. Uh, here's the foregut up here. This is where we're going to make the esophagus and lungs from. All right, so esophagus, stomach, and trachea all are derived from foregut. So this is the foregut tube. And the first thing that happens, you get a little growth. or some genes turned on in this region. Genes are prevented from being turned on here. By We won't get into all that. But the genes start to uh, proliferate, and they grow a bump. And the bump gets bigger and bigger. It's called the lung bump or lung bud. And that grows and grows and grows into the lungs, into the trachea, into the tracheobronchial tree. Uh, great. But these two are connected together. So during the latter phases of this process, a separation is, quote, supposed to occur here. And problems occur when a separation doesn't occur. And there's some other mutations that can occur as well. So we'll take a look at some of those. So the most common one of them is called esophageal atresia. Uh, one in 3,500 births. That's more prevalent than my Marfan syndrome bottom. Marfan's is 0 0.01 uh, prevalence. And this is incident, so the prevalence would be uh, perhaps higher. Uh, so it's 0.03% of births. One in 3,500 births this happens to. And what is esophageal atresia? It occurs when the esophagus fails to connect to the stomach. Uh, so here's the trachea. The lungs are okay, but here's the problem. There's the esophagus in the back of the trachea, and what happened? It's a dead end. So that's no good, right? That's supposed to... Try my drawing tools again. That's supposed to connect all the way down. Down here, right? To the stomach. Yeah, but it doesn't. Okay, so that's a problem. And then there's off, often other types of uh, anomalies with this as well. But that's the big one because what's going to happen when he takes food in? It's not going to go here, but it's going to pile up. When mother's milk starts piling up, where's it going to go? Little baby's going to start choking like crazy, right? It's going to start getting down into the larynx. Some of it's going to get down into the trachea and into the bronchial tree. And little guys got a pneumonia. I mean, they can die from this. So they they got to be very vigilant. They don't burp up milk like crazy. If they do, they got to find out what's going on with that. Right? Typically discovered shortly after birth, these babies will get no food. Right? You can't. There's no connection to the stomach. Uh, so the the, the regurgitated liquid uh, will be. It's called aspirated. Right? That means it went down into the lungs where it's not supposed to, and that sets up aspiration pneumonia. It can be very dangerous. So in addition to that dead end, uh, which is kind of the atresia, the dead or blind end, about 93% of them have a second abnormality. What is that abnormality? It's an abnormal connection with the lungs. Uh, so this is called a fistula uh, when the esophagus connects to the lung. Esophagus is not supposed to connect to the lungs, right? So they are usually born with two of these defects. Uh, and with a case with esophageal atresia, we can tell you the fistula is usually between the esophagus and the trachea itself, not the lung tissue. Right? These are categories by the gross system, which has been around forever. The most common one of these things is a gross C 
uh, classification. The uh, uh, Vogat is another classification. We don't worry about those. Uh, gross, about 85% of them have this gross classification type C, uh, esophageal atresia. So it's not the only one, but let's look at what a gross C looks like. So this is the gross C. Here's the trachea, primary main stem bronchi here. Esophagus is dead end. There's where your atresia comes from. Uh, but in this case, they have a connection of the esophagus to the trachea. Uh, so this is pretty simple to fix, right? All they have to do surgically is cut this off and sew it back together. Uh, and that's exactly what they do. Very successful at AMAD, my ad. Uh, there's other types. There's 8% just have this and that's it. They're going to have to put some Gore-Tex or some type of uh, graft material that hopefully is anti-emogenic so immune system doesn't reject it. Uh, but this is the most common type. Okay, and remember there's two, right? So there's a, a blinded, a dead end esophagus and then we have an abnormal connection right here, right? And what's that abnormal connection called? Or is it fistula? Fistula. We'll talk about other types of fistulas as well. What's the ideology? There's definitely a gene, some gene mutations that have been discovered. We won't get into those. But other than that, it's not completely understood. Uh, the gene mutations may be environmental, caused from smoking, some theories have been. But we do know exactly uh, what where the mutation occurs. It's somewhere in the sonic hedgehog signaling pathway. We won't get into the specifics on this, but there's sonic hedgehog. That's the problem with this. Uh, what's the treatment? Emergency surgery is indicated, right? The little guy can't, or girl, they can't get food in their stomach. So emergency surgery, and pretty hard to get an IV in a, a newborn. It's not easy. Uh, so they got to reconnect that esophagus uh, with the right esophagus and cut it loose from the trachea and close the trachea up. Condition used to be fatal. Uh, mortality rates now for healthy individuals, babies without other complications, is near near zero percent. It's a very very successful surgery uh, for this type. Now there are some the little babies not out of the woods yet, because if they did have esophageal atresia, they are they have one check mark in a syndrome called Vactorol. Okay, so esophageal atresia is a member of the vectoral symptom complex. So these are a cluster of birth defects that tend to occur together. Some of them aren't that dangerous. Some of them are quite dangerous. So you need three of these to get the diagnosis of vectoral syndrome. So, so far we got one, esophageal atresia. Where is it? Um, right here. It's a uh, esophageal tracheal fistula is part of esophageal atresia. Um, so check check that one right. Hey, let's get my drawing tool again. Check that guy right off. Wow, that's too long of a check. Anyway, uh, so you can see there's some other th scary numbers here. So if your child is born with esophageal uh, tracheal esophageal fistula uh, or atresia, got a 60% chance you're going to have more of these things, uh, and including cardiac defects. They may have atrial septal defects, ventricular septal defects, uh, tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, the ones you learned in embryology are all come into play. Vertebral defects, spina bifida they could have, uh, things like that, which you hopefully learned in embryology as well. Uh, and limb abnormalities. They can have kidney problems, all sorts of uh, anal atresia is not that serious, but I mean the cardiogenic defects can be quite serious. Okay, now let's switch over. So that's enough of the congenital ones. Let's switch over to uh, esophageal stenosis. What's stenosis mean? I have to play with this a little bit more here. So here's a tube. This can be any tube. This could be the vertebral canal. So you got a tube. Boy, this one's harder to draw. My Dell is a lot, the trackpad is a lot better on my Dell. So I'm not liking this alien. It's got a big screen though, because I have my backup camera, 
going right now and filming. It actually came out really good, just in case Camtasia has one of its moments and I lose the video, I don't have to redo it again because you can still see and hear it on my on my backup system. Oh, thank you. Potential spam. Boy, we're getting spam calls like crazy during this crisis, right? I must be getting 100 pieces of junk mail. Never seen so much junk mail come through. Anyway, I digress. Stenosis is when something like a tumor uh, or anything clogs the lumen uh, to the point where stuff can't pass. So that's what stenosis is. Same thing with stricture. So the esophagus is just a tube, right? So we can get we can get the the whole of that tube narrowed. So stricture and soft and stenosis are used interchangeably. So make sure you know that AKA. So it's it's when something narrows the esophageal lumen and narrows it to the point where the bolus of food or water gets blocked or interfered with when you're trying to swallow it. So it could be a complete blockage, or usually it's an incomplete. It starts out as incomplete. It could be cancer growing in there, right? That kind of like a beaver dam growing bigger and bigger. Uh, here's a barium swallow. This is a fluoroscopic view of barium. That's went down the esophagus, and bam, it's severely constricted, right, uh, in this case. So this is incomplete structure. A little bit is still getting flu, but it's pretty almost complete. Sorry, I'm fighting back a yawn. It's a lot of lecturing for me on this day. And I feel sorry for you because you got to study all this stuff. But you can, at least with these videos, you can string it out a little bit so you don't have to watch these all today. Which I noticed, I think only five people watched the one this morning, C CVPP. So I see you're already stringing them out. Don't let them build up, though. Don't get too far behind. Uh, so, uh, so let's talk about acquired esophageal uh, stricture. That means acquired something caused it. Uh, you weren't born with this problem. There's three categories of acquired esophageal stricture. Intrinsic, extrinsic, iatrogenic always means what? Man-made problem. Intrinsic means it's inside something with the esophagus itself. Extrinsic means the problem is outside, like right next to the esophagus, like maybe a lymph node that's grown really big from cancer, from infection, and it's crushing the esophagus that way. So let's look at some intrinsic causes first. The number one cause of intrinsic acquired stenosis is GERD. So if you keep if you keep burping up acid over and over and over again, maybe you're the type that doesn't have a lot of nerve fiber and you don't even know this is happening to you. You can start to scar up the esophagus. Uh, typically, you get a Barrett's esophagus with this association. Uh, but if you keep if it keeps going on, you can start hypertrophying and scarring to the point where it starts making the esophagus really stiff and even with the lumen narrowed. Uh, so that is definitely a problem. It, GERD even shrinks the esophagus. It can actually cause a hiatal hernia, as we, as we will learn, from the shrinkage of the esophagus. It starts to pull the stomach right up inside the thoracic cavity. Uh, inflammatory diseases. I cut it off in this one, but we'll look at this one on our next, uh, next Thursday. Uh, this is eosinophilic esophagitis, very similar to GERD. It's an inflammatory condition. can also because of repeated bouts of inflammation. Uh, you can build up a beaver dam of scar tissue and block swallowing. Cancer, same thing. Cancer can grow and grow and grow, and maybe your first sign of esophageal cancer is all of a sudden you're, uh, a big bite of meat or a big swallow of food, a big bolus is like starting to hurt or feel weird, like it's getting stuck. Not a good sign. you got to go in and get that checked ASAP. When the food gets stuck, I think I said this before, but when the food does get stuck or it, you have discomfort, um, that has a name that's called dysphagia. If it just is difficult swallowing, but it doesn't really hurt. If it hurts, that's odinophagia, right? Or odinophagia, I call it odinophagia. Uh, and without treatment, um, yeah, if food is starting to back up in there, as we're going to see in a minute, an example of this, 
you can get a bacterial infection, burl a hole right through that esophagus, and you get a perforation. And now you're in trouble. You have to have surgery. If it happens in the abdominal esophagus, you could get peritonitis and die from that real quick. Remember we talked about in the last lecture that uh, the abdominal portion of the esophagus is interperitoneal. Uh, so you can get, if you get a perforation, you can get peritonitis, which can turn into septicemia in a blink of the eye. Okay, uh, so the back of food can also stretch the walls of the intestine and trigger those mechanoreceptors. Okay, check this out. Uh, so this is a normal looking esophagus. You guys, we learned how to look at these in the last video. That's not a good sign, is it? Same view. So that's esophageal carcinoma. Uh, that's caused a beaver dam. Can you uh, imagine a big piece of steak trying to pass through there? And this patient, that was the problem, came in with severe dysphagia, and the doc's like, why, on, why in the world did you wait so long for this? So example of intrinsic acquired esophageal stricture or stenosis. Okay, what about extrinsic causes of stricture? Uh, so these are things that push into the esophagus from the outside. So like tumors, lymph nodes, infections, any uh, a bleeding aneurysm that swells up really big. Uh, so it's got to be something from the outside pushing in. What about iatrogenic causes? Number one uh, is probably, well, probably use of aspirin. They didn't say which one the number. Fischelli didn't say which one was number one. But uh, here's a common one because Barrett's esophagus a lot of times you need to burn out the precancerous tissue via radiofrequency. And if they burn out too much, it's down in the distal esophagus, you can get a whole gob of scar tissue and it causes a beaver dam. 7% of the people with RF ablation for Barrett's esophagus causes another problem, causes dysphagia when swallowing because of the scar tissue. Really tough to treat scar tissue. You can't take it out because it comes back usually worse. Same thing for microdiscectomy. Uh, if you scar your SOL, there's no treatment for it. Radiation therapy for cancer can do it. Uh, esophageal surgery of any kind. Chronic use of aspirins. This is a common one. People take the half a baby aspirin uh, to thin out their blood as they get older, and maybe the esophagus is not tolerating it very well. The symptoms could be dysphagia, as we said. Here's the official slide of this, dysphagia is trouble swallowing. It's not painful, uh, but it might be associated with pain, and if it's associated with pain, uh, we do have odinophagia, odinophagia, and that's actually pain with swallowing. And then you might have just esophageal pain after a meal, so you're not even swallowing, yet you have you have pain. Okay, another thing we need to talk about is globus. So this is the feeling of a lump in your throat or something stuck in your throat all the time. Uh, and it could be secondary to a stricture or inflammation. Uh, it's also commonly seen in patients uh, with in problems with anxiety and stress and other psychological disorders. Uh, it's very common. They, they feel like there's something in my throat or something in their throats, and they, you know, they go to the doc and they stick a scope down there, and there's nothing there. Uh, but oftentimes there is. It could be some type of structure or inflammation in there. Another type of symptom, of course, is pain if it's really bad. And it's that vague referred pain. It could be pre to the precordial region, which is over your heart. That's the precordium. Could be to the sternal region, to the xiphoid region, to the parasternal region. Uh, and they may, I mean, these all, we'll, we'll get to all these um, as we can. As time, we'll talk about which ones are which. Uh, but weight loss is another problem. They, they decide they don't want to eat anymore. Uh, because it hurts when they swallow, so they start losing weight. Here's an example of such narrowing, such stricture. Uh, and yeah, it's trouble. this patient would have trouble swallowing things. They might revert to just eating soup. How do you make the diagnosis of stricture? You order something called a barium swallow. So very effective at making the diagnosis. You swallow barium, and they use fluoroscopy, 
which is like a low radiation exposure x-ray. Uh, and they can see the barium and they can see where it gets pinched. So here's the beaver dam, right? Right there's the beaver dam. Uh, that's part of a order upper GI series that comes with it. Um, yeah, and these are called fill defects. Uh, very similar to you can order a CT myelogram on patients where you fill the thecal sac up with dye and you look for these defects from a bone spur might look just like this in the thecal sac or the nerve root sleeve. Okay, what's the sequelae of stricture? Uh, food impaction is a big problem with these people. Can you imagine swallowing a, a giant piece of steak not chewed up? Uh, that thing would get stuck, and that's a problem. That's called food impaction. And yeah, f uh, risk factors for food impaction are stenosis or stricture of the esophagus. Uh, or if you just eat like a savage and eat a giant piece of meat and don't chew it and try to swallow it just to see how big a piece you can swallow, I mean, that can do it. Uh, and failure to proper chew. But all of these things, I mean, normally you can swallow a pretty big piece of meat, um, but if you do have some stenosis from maybe GERD or something, it's got an increased risk to get stuck. Uh, the symptoms of food impaction are the same gang. Dys, uh, dysphagia, or maybe flat-out pain when you swallow adenophagia, globus, chest pain. Here's another one called water brash. Uh, if you got some food starting to... Uh, a little inflammation process starting where the stricture is, uh, those cells spit out too much mucus, and you're always coughing up a go gobs of extra mucus. That's called water brash. Water brash. You can get that with GERD uh, just as well. What's the treatment for someone with a food impactus? They have to get to the ER within 24 hours, or they risk damaging their esophagus uh, permanently. Uh, the bacteria, you can imagine, uh, from food getting stuck, they grow like crazy and they invade the esophageal wall and inflammation starts and you can have a perforation from that. So you got to go to the ER. Uh, 24 hours is anything over 24 hours you start damaging your esophagus. Right. Uh, yep. And you could, if this happens in the abdominal esophagus, you could get peritonitis from this. Let's do a case study. So here's a 35-year-old obese male comes into your office complaining of chest pain or denophagia. He thinks maybe it's a he needs an adjustment. Uh, pulse is blood pressure slightly elevated. You take a good history and you find out about 48 hours ago uh, he had an enormous meal, ma mainly pork and potatoes, 48 hours ago. And history revealed that he had a Barrett's esophagus uh, surgery about five years ago. So they did a, probably a RF fablation. So he's probably got stenosis, right? And this big piece of meat or whatever got stuck is what I'm thinking. Uh, since uh, this eating event, he's had trouble swallowing. He's had dysphagia and it's gotten progressively worse to adenophagia. What do you do? Do you give him an atlas adjustment or axis? No, of course not. You send him to the ER, right? You scold him. Why didn't you go to the ER? Um, so they sent him to the ER, and they immediately got an endoscope and stuck it down his throat. You want to see what they saw? Here's a normal esophagus, right? We've seen that before. You ready for this? Yeah. So that's... <laughs> I laugh every time I see this. I'm like, my God, he did, it looks like he didn't even chew. He just swallowed the, these are big chunks of pork, not even chewed up. So people do crazy things. Um, and you can see the inflammation. And they took it out, and it's too late. So this, it's gone. It's cleaned out. And he's already got a wicked inflammation. These are all bacteria infections. And he ended up having quite a bad uh, stricture from this. Uh, worse than the Barrett's esophagus, and now he always has trouble with swallowing. So, got to get to the ER. You got to use your head. All right. So that's the end of this. We'll talk about heterotopic, uh, tropic, uh, heterotropic gastric mucosa in the next video. And enjoy the weekend. Email me any questions that you may have.